Warning, the language in today's episode is going to get a little spicy. Explicit language about sex is used. Please be advised. So, Conscious, how do you feel about celebrity couples and do you have a favorite? I think that sometimes they can be a bit superficial, like we pay too much attention to them. Mm-hmm. But I do recognize like the relevance of celebrity couples. And um, I feel like my favorite capitalists are definitely Beyonce and Jay-Z. <laughs> I really respect you for adding that moniker. It's, you know, it's fair. A lot of people think about celebrity couples as sometimes being for show, for PR. They're not real. Um, they've just always been a, a topic of discussion throughout history. And back in 1928, Harlem Renaissance poet County Cullen and Yolanda Du Bois were the Jay-Z and Beyonce of their time. Well, at least they were supposed to be. But in reality, County was trying to save his career by appeasing the status quo, even if it meant going against his inner desires. Let's get into some Black history for real. It's April 9th, 1928. County leads his nine groomsmen out the altar in his father's church, Salem Methodist. Time for the show. He can hear Langston complaining under his breath about his rented tux. It's chafing his neck, but he didn't pay for it. He should just play along. County glances briefly at the crowd. He's never seen a church so full. 3,000 people pressed shoulder to shoulder. Here to watch the Duke and the Duchess of the Talented Tenth tie the knot, jump the broom, that holy matrimony type move. His father, Reverend Cullen, is waiting for him in a sea of tall green palms, roses, tulips, calla lilies, and ferns. Easter lilies too. It's Easter weekend. With all the flowers, there is barely any room left for the wedding party. County steps into his place. A white dove hangs over his head, suspended in air by a cord. Dear God, so much going on. It's overwhelming. More birds hang on the balcony railing, canaries in the cage, alternating with baskets of mixed flowers. It's too much. But it's what W.E.B. wants. W.E.B. Du Bois always gets what he wants. The Negro social event of the decade, his daughter marries poet County Cullen. The Black High Society meets the young, hot literary scene, the perfect merger. 16 bridesmaids glide down the aisle in blue taffeta dresses. Silver bands around their heads match their silver shoes and stockings. They all travel in a special rail car with the bride this morning. Baltimore to New York. County of Justice Collar. He's chafing too. Choking action. Yolanda appears on the arm of her father. Her light skin almost blending in with the cream-colored satin of her dress. A bouquet of white roses and lilies of the valley trembles in her hand. Or did County imagine that? He's racked with nerves himself. His best man, Harold Jackman, comforts him with a hand to his shoulder. County here is Langston and Arna snickering behind him. This is silly. She's not as tight. A she? Can't be. W.E.B. gives Yolanda over to him. The old man is grinning from ear to ear. This is his moment. County is touched that this legend wants him for a son. Yolanda's eyes are dead. She offers County a faint little smile. He tries not to step on her saddening tool train. He knows it's a family heirloom. They're family now. I now pronounce you man and wife. They jump the broom. The crowd cheers. County embraces the love. He looks over his shoulder at his best man, Harold. Harold got bedroll eyes. County prays for a moment. Jesus, lead me not into temptation.
When you're an American Express Platinum Card member, don't be surprised if you say things like, Chef, what course are we on? I've, I've lost count. Or, shoot that, shoot that! And even... Checkout's not until 4, so... Because the American Express Platinum Card offers access to exclusive reservations at renowned restaurants, elevated experiences at live events, and 4 p.m. late checkout at fine hotels and resorts booked through Amex Travel. That's the powerful backing of American Express. See how to elevate your experiences at americanexpress.com slash with Amex. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you in part by Audible, your go-to destination for thrilling audio entertainment. Whether you're looking for a hair-raising experience to enjoy while you're on the move or eager to dive into sinister and shocking tales, Audible has an exclusive collection of thrillers from best-selling authors that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Like The Guest List by Lucy Foley. Experience stories like never before, where every chilling detail is brought to life by captivating sound design. Plus, as an Audible member, choose one title a month to make yours forever. And now, new members can try Audible free for 30 days. Just visit audible.com slash WonderyPod or text WonderyPod to 500-500. That's audible.com slash WonderyPod or text WonderyPod to 500-500. Black as heritage, black as royalty, from head to toe. Black as beautiful, black as handsome, not just for funerals. From Wondery, this is Black History for Real, where we chronicle the stories of movers and shakers from Black history all over the world. The stories will inspire you, educate you, and more often than not, leave you shaking your damn heads. I'm Francesca Ramsey. And I'm Conscious Lee, continuing our four-part series on the Harlem Renaissance in the Talented 10th. Today, we're sticking with Harlem Renaissance poet, County Cullen. We'll explore how his ambition drove him to hide his sexuality and get married to the most high-profile beard imaginable. This is episode three, Dilemma. When County Cullen left his conservative, religious home in Harlem for New York University, he finally had a safe space to explore his sexuality. And he found someone who could help him define it. In 1923, Alan Locke became his first confidant. Alan was a professor at Howard University with the network in Harlem. County was a 19-year-old NYU undergrad. Alan suggested that County read Edward Carpenter's anthology of friendship, A. O. Lewis. It was really about gay love. It opened up for me soul windows which had been closed. County wrote Allen, thanking him for giving him the book. For County, the book showed gay love to be as natural as straight love. There wasn't anything wrong with him. Inspired by the book, County tries out a romantic relationship with Ralph Lowe. The affair lasts one month. His attempts at sex with Ralph don't go so well. In a letter to Allen, County says he's afraid of fumbling his approach. He doesn't want to bend the twig the wrong way. Wow. I can't get over here. What a poet. Bend the twig. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that one before. I don't think you bend it. I don't, I don't think that's what you're supposed to do. Um, but I can. It's so funny. We are so um, we're so fortunate that. We have access to so much information now. You know what I mean? Like if, if you're curious, you can go out and find so much information on romantic relationships and, and what partnership and families look like and, and exploring your sexuality. And then you think about County in the situation where he he's like, I'm ready, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> He reads a book and he thinks he has some insight, but he doesn't know. It's just uh, like you feel I feel for him, but it, it is comical that he uses this uh, Ben the Twig analogy is hilarious. I, I just got one question to you, Francesca. What? So is he referring to himself or is he referring <laughs> to, 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 to homie? Like is who, who? What's the twig? Who the twig? He, he talking about his twig or his buddy the twig? 
This episode is brought to you by Black History for Real Unfiltered. <laughs> <laughs> County gets back on the horse pretty quickly, this time with a white lover named Donald Duff. That only lasts only a month, but County thinks enough of him to dedicate his poem, Tableau, to him. Locked arm in arm, they cross the way, the black boy and the white, the golden splendor of the day, the sable pride of night. From lowered blinds, the dark folk stare and hear fair folk talk, indignant that those two should dare in unison to walk. I got two thoughts to this one right here. You feel me? The first thing is I recognize how politicized interracial dating is in both heterosexual settings and in queer settings. And the second thing is I want to just remind everybody that, you know, the history got a little queerness, a little transness, a little disability in black history and making sure you ain't lost in the sauce and being heteronormative or being caught up in like some misogynistic idea that we ain't got, you feel me, yeah. outside of Rosa Parks and Harriet tell me like we ain't got people. So it's just like, just, just those, those are two things that come to mind. Yeah, wholeheartedly. And especially because there are too many people who think, oh, no, 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 you can't talk about that or we only come in in one in one way and the reality is blackness is expansive and there are so many different intersecting identities within our history and all of those stories deserve to be told yeah on uh, papa grave i'm gonna say this i'm gonna say it real simple it's gonna be a little explicit but speaking specifically to black folks it's okay to love and care for other black people that fuck different than you or that believe in a different God. Like, that's important to say that way because I acknowledge that those two things are usually how we are able to distance or alienate people in our, in, in our community. Like, it's okay. County seems bold in his poetry, but buttoned up in his real life. Being openly gay is dangerous to County's dreams of being a literary star. He uses the press to project the image of himself that he thinks will get him there. He controls his image. He zeroes in on his work. County lands a profile in the February 10th edition of Brooklyn Daily Eagle's Sunday Magazine. If I'm going to be a poet at all, I'm going to be a poet and not Negro poet. That is what hindered the development of artists among us. Their one note has been the concern with their race. That is all very well, none of us can get away from it. I cannot at times. You will see it in my verse. The consciousness of this is too poignant at times. I cannot escape it. But what I mean is this, I shall not write of Negro subjects for the purpose of propaganda. I acknowledge that County, like many other black folks that make this declaration, they have amazing intentions in terms of not being pathologized as just like a racial X, but just being seen as X. But I think it's like, you know, a, a, a bit of colorblindness. You see what I'm saying? That this right. is being deployed. <laughs> right. And I think that also what we see is being illustrated right here is going back to W.E.B. Du Bois's kind of lessons. I think that County is really illustrating the tension between double consciousness trying to balance how the world see you and how you see yourself it's always already a contradiction that a lot of black folks is forced to reconcile and sometimes folks reconcile with this one i can see all sides in that respect because you know as a as a performer and as a creative my blackness is inherent in my work and in my perspective but it can be really frustrating when you're put in this box and people are only wanting you to speak on certain things and they only think you're limited or you are limited to certain subjects or certain um, spaces or, or certain proficiencies because of who you are. And so to your point about the double consciousness, it's a really fine line to be who you are while also asking and demanding the space to be more than what people expect of you because of what you look like, where you come from, who you love, what your body is, whatever it may be. It's such a constant struggle. And but you're right. There's also this level of the col the colorblindness thing, but also like the kumbaya world version of like, don't see me as black. Like, 
you're not you're you are black though. <laughs> like, yeah, because you know Harry Belafonte, a mm-hmm. few other people really used to make those declarations, and it's like, hey, I get it. You don't want to be black, held I'm to OJ. This, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> it's like I recognize no no nobody wants to be tied to a static notion. You feel me? Of like having a particular race or particular identity. To me, I think that the better way to be able to say it is like, yes, I am black. You don't get to refine my blackness to what you always presume it to be. I get to define what they look like. Yeah. Blackness is part of who I am. It's not the totality of who I am. It's part of it shapes my experience. It's not the only thing that shapes my experience. And I think that that is difficult for people to acknowledge that both things can be true. You can feel like you're being put in a box and you can also inherently inhibit that box because that's who you are. And that song, Baby White Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Writing primarily about blackness doesn't mean the work isn't artful. And it doesn't automatically become propaganda. Of course not. And like we said before, County is ambitious. He wants as big of an audience as he can get. And he is determined to do whatever he can to stop blackness from getting in the way of that. In his profile, he's putting white people on notice. Do not put me in a box. His bold attitude pays off and his career takes off. He publishes poems and major publications like Harper's Magazine and The Crisis. The press becomes curious about the man behind the words, though. County sits with one leg crossed over the other, hands clasped over his belly. He's trying to appear relaxed in front of this reporter. He's got an image to protect now. You're so young. How do you write love poetry as vividly as you do? The reporter asks. County doesn't have to even think about it. He slowly takes a sip of his coffee anyway, making the reporter wait. By reading books and observing other people, he's playing the virgin card. It's almost honest. I mean, he is a virgin with women. He shifts in his seat, puffs his chest out a little bit. He wants to come across as confident, natural, masculine. The reporter asks another question about his love life. What kind of women is he interested in? County nervously pivots the conversation to the classical education he received in high school. His mind goes to his parents. They wouldn't want him talking about his love life in the papers, even if he was talking from his heart about women. They're too conservative and Christian for that. If the reverend and his wife knew about the men, County would be an orphan again. As he shakes the reporter's hand and thanks him for the interview, County decides he has to find the right woman to marry, someone who can cure his homosexuality. County starts shopping around for the perfect woman to complement his image as a scholar. His best friend and occasional lover, Harold Jackman, introduces him to a Fish University student named Yolanda Du Bois as in W.E.B. Du Bois' daughter. Yolanda is nice and smart. They both have famous fathers, demanding fathers. County can imagine a snapshot in the papers. Yolanda on his arm, strolling down 125th Street. He writes to Adam Rock about her in August 1923 and goes as far as to call Yolanda the possible solution to the problem of his homosexuality. But it's only a month later when County finds his feelings about Yolanda have changed. He suddenly considers her age a problem. She's three years older than him, three. She has more romantic experience than he does, and on top of that, she's not even in New York. That's not going to help him raise his profile. No matter how much time he and Lana spent together, he still had the urge to sleep with men. Uh, County, I was on your side, bro. You, you, you're going through a lot. <laughs> and I feel for you. But not you I'm coming sorry, up man. with I'm excuses. Oh, uh, she's too old. You know, come on. You know, you, you don't want to be with her in the first place. How, wh- how old? Three years is not a lot. 
That's not on, t- on, on top of that. Let's let's pull out these birth certificates and see these other men you're sleeping with. How, how old are they? Right. How old, how old are they? You just making excuses <laughs> at this point. You know, and I'm not just saying this because I am, a you know, I am solidly middle aged at this point. And I've been known to entertain a young suitor from time. And, and, you know, it happens. I'm not above it. <laughs> so the three year age difference county. I'm giving you I'm giving you side eye for that. Yeah, he he definitely he definitely playing on our face with that one. I think it just speaks to the fact that he knows this is not someone he's actually romantically interested in. So he's coming up with any excuse to dismiss her when yeah. in actuality he doesn't want to be with a woman, period. And it's yeah. it's sad that he felt the need. You know, we can poke fun at the obviousness of like Come on, three years isn't a big deal. But it's sad when you really think about the fact that he's like really wrestling with the fact that he needs to figure out a potential partner so that he can secure his future. And as sad as it is, like his fears are are justified and valid in response to the time. Right. And, and, And even today, that's something that some people are still grappling with, not being able to love who they want because of the consequences in a world that says they're not supposed to do that. Yeah, I think I think that this is one of the greatest symptoms of how the straight agenda operates. Though people don't usually coin it that way and yeah. how people get pushed in the closets. I know typically we talk about, you know, gay agendas and people getting emasculated and all that old nonsense. But I feel like with this County Cullen story, I think it illustrates how pervasive the straight agenda becomes and how violent it can be for all parties involved. Yolanda is very sweet, though. Despite County's harbored reservations, they continue to write letters to each other. In the meantime, County continues dating men and concentrating on his career. He graduates NYU with his Phi Beta Kappa key. In 1925, while getting his master's at Harvard, he publishes Color, a critically acclaimed collection of poetry. When he returns to Harlem in 1926, he decides he really needs to find a long-term girlfriend. But will this tactic keep the gossip rags off his scent? Professional welder Shayna Ford used VR training developed by ForgeFX to hone her skills as a welder. The more time that you spend practicing it, that's what separates a good welder from a great welder. VR training can help students like Shayna repeatedly practice specific skills. Virtual reality definitely helps because the more muscle memory that you have, the smoother your weld is. Explore more stories like Shayna's at meta.com slash metaverse impact. When you choose Organic Valley, not only will you be enjoying great-tasting dairy, you'll help to save over 1,600 small organic family farms who are protecting over 400,000 acres of organic farmland and all the plants and animals that call it home. This is dairy you can feel good about. It's great-tasting, high-quality organic dairy ethically sourced from small organic family farms. To find Organic Valley Dairy near you, visit ov.coop. That's ov.coop. Black is beautiful. When County gets serious about finding a long-term girlfriend, he goes for women with impressive pedigrees. He sets his sights on Fiona Brathwaite, daughter of writer, poet, and famous anthologist William Stanley Brathwaite. William happened to publish a lot of Harlem Renaissance writers in his anthologies. Both he and County didn't like to discuss race in their work. Oh yeah, Fiona would make a perfect wife. But County isn't the only Harlem Renaissance player looking for a beard at the time. The NYPD is raiding queer clubs and cafes. Folks were being arrested and charged with homosexual activities and gay Harlem Renaissance artists seek refuge in seemingly straight relationships. Alan Locke throws his hat in the ring with Fiona. County suddenly has serious competition. Alan has a lot more money. County can't compete. But it's okay. He's got another iron in the fire. He's talking to Sidonia Bird, a young woman he met while he attended Harvard. 
She was studying music at the Boston Conservatory. And, as it mattered to County, her family had money. The Black press ate up his affairs with Fiona and Sidonia. They note this normal development of his love life. In April 1926, County wrote to his best friend Harold about the two women. He was thrilled that the rumor mill was churning about his affairs. He liked the idea of being a playboy. For the first time in my life, I feel what it means to be a chic, even if only on a small scale. This part of the story is showing why when it comes to formulated analysis about patriarchy and misogyny, they got to go past heteronormative ideas or just straight straight men and it's thinking about how the positionality of being men in many different instances allow for those bodies to really see women as objects to obtain to solidify some status may it oh, be yeah. a, a, you know what i'm saying uh being a player or being a beard or, or being, a, being, being a, beard. a chic yeah i mean like he's like look at me i got a harem it's only got it's only got two but i still got one i mean here he is hiding this part of his identity while at the same time using these women and and dehumanizing them by like being excited about the fact that there are rumors about who is he with and uh, and he's he's not being truthful with them or with himself see around this time county develops a friendship with w.e.b du bois it prompts him to take another look at the mentor's daughter, Yolanda. A relationship with Yolanda would make for pretty easy living. After all, they never stop writing letters, and she remains funny and kind. She even takes notes of his successes. In his own letters, County starts to flirt more and goes for visits to Baltimore, where Yolanda lives. Though County is mostly focused on Yolanda, another contender in Tisterine. It's 1926. 19-year-old Dorothy West holds hands with her cousin Helene so they don't lose each other as they make their way through the crowd. There are more than a thousand Negroes here for the second annual Opportunity Magazine Awards dinner. A well-dressed woman grabs Dorothy's elbow. Congratulations on your prize, she says. Dorothy smiles and thanks her. You look familiar. Have we met in Boston or, or maybe Martha's Vineyard? Dorothy asks. Helene pulls her along before she can hear the answer. Come on, girl, we have important people to meet. Helene's just spotted Langston Hughes and County Cullen chatting with Zora Neale Hurston. The two wade through a sea of writers and editors, intellectuals and donors. Well, well, well. If it isn't the kid who shares second prize with Zora, fresh out of high school, Langston says, teasing Zora. County is the first to acknowledge the women. He stretches out his hand. Dorothy takes it. His hands are soft and his voice is gentle. Congratulations, he says. Dorothy thanks him. She's fixated on the Phi Beta Kappa Key County is wearing on his gold chain. It glimmers in the light. Helene chimes in. She started writing when she was only seven years old, just a freshman in high school, and Dorothy gets a story published in the Boston Post. Helene is bragging on her again. Dorothy grimaces, thinking she can't compare to someone like County Cullen or Langston Hughes. Did you hear that, Zora? You tied with a real wonder kid, Langston says. Zora gives Langston the side eye. She turns to Dorothy, smiles, and pats her arm. I'm proud to be tied with another woman, Zora says earnestly. <laughs> she ain't a woman. <laughs> She's a girl, Langston chuckles. I was a bit of a wonder kid myself, County says. I know, Dorothy replies. She proceeds to tell him everything she knows about him. All the prizes he won, how amazing the poems and color are. She recites one of her favorite right there in the end. Dorothy is nervous that she's gone too far by reciting this poem. Helene is nowhere to be found. Dorothy didn't even notice that she snuck off. When she looks up into County's face, he's smiling. It's a small, proud smile, offset by a little blush in his cheeks. Tell me about the typewriter, 
the short story you won prize for. He says, they fall into a deep conversation and then a fast friendship. Dorothy thinks he is the real prize and County thinks Dorothy could be just what he needs to protect his career. County flirts with Dorothy for a while, but he decides to go all in on Yolanda with help from W.E.B. Du Bois. Columns in the Amsterdam News and the Interstate Tadler gossip about a new trend in Renaissance circles, straight couples. What is this thing, anyhow? Richard Bruce and Mary Fair, both equally well-known in Harlem and the Village, waiting up nights for each? Can it be that the thing is getting fashionable? First County Cullen and Yolanda Du Bois, with R. Schlick and Panama following closely. Now Bruce and Fair? I don't think County would have survived in this social media age, because while the tabloids are talking about his straight relationships, he's still dating men. He kind of reckless about it too. Rumors begin to swirl. He realizes that he must get married to protect his reputation. Not just out in the world, but also at home. His parents have a reputation to uphold. To be fair, County does like women. They make great friends, fun to be around. He just doesn't want to sleep with them. That's what marriage becomes anyway, a sexless friendship, right? and he could learn to be more discreet with his boyfriends. Now, he's got a plan. A lot of individuals that are our age, around our age and older, think about how when they were growing up, there wasn't many representations or any representations of like gay love or great gay relationships or queer love or queer relationships. That resulted into a lot of individuals really being gay or queer and having to hide their relationships because people wasn't ready to see it being depicted. Yeah, it also it makes me also think about like the expansiveness of love and that we are so focused on monogamous relationships, which there's nothing wrong with it. But I'm also of the mind that like a lot of people would be happier if they were able to share with their partner, like, I want to be able to be in partnership with you, but also see other people and like not lie and not, you know, um, cheat on each other. And 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 again, not show your full selves. And, and it's one of those things that I know is hard for people to wrap their minds around. But one thing that I really I'm so thankful for as I've been able to really explore my queer identity is the idea that romantic relationships and partnerships can look all different sorts of ways. And so when I think about County saying like, I like women, right? And I I, I want to be around women. It's like, there is a world in which he, he didn't have to sneak around. He didn't have to hide those parts of himself, right? Like there's right. a world in which you could say, I'm in partnership with you and our partnership looks the way that we want it to. And I'm also in partnership with this person and they're not in conflict. It doesn't mean that I love you less. And our relationship isn't less valid because it's not a sexual relationship. We can still have love for each other and still build and take care of each other in a way that is caring and respectful and honest and real, but doesn't necessarily fit everybody else's definition of what a a relationship looks like. And I just wish more people would give themselves that freedom, no matter whatever your sexuality Facts. is. To say, like, Facts. you can build relationships however you want. Our our strive to have a nuclear family creates a lot of, like, heteronormative violence and exclusion for individuals that don't conform to them identities. And I just think that whether we're talking about poetry, jazz music, or hip-hop, we see that there is something that's consistent about homophobia and how different people sometimes have to use women as 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 fungible beards to be able to prove they, you know, what I'm saying masculinity. Um, and I feel like it's all got to do with like white supremacy and a nuclear family and us feeling like the only way we can prove our self-worth and our worthiness to the world is by being able to mimic those units like that. And it's just like, nah, that's, that's that, a lot of times that should be anti-black at its core. It's the holiday season of 1927. County pulls a small box out of his coat pocket and carefully pulls off the top. A small diamond sparkles inside. He closes the box, a pain in his stomach. Nerves. A marriage to Yolanda would be good for his career. But is she really the woman to do this with? So high profile. Their marriage would be like walking a tightrope. What happens if he falls? He slips down the hall at the Du Bois home. 
The Christmas tree fills the air with the scent of pine. A wreath hangs over the fireplace. Garland intertwines with the staircase railing. He arrives at the door to W.E.B.'s library. It's open. County takes a deep breath and goes inside. What a pleasant surprise. W.E.B. says as he stands to greet the young man. The party doesn't begin for hours. Is there something wrong? County crosses the room to sit across from the boys. I received your letter and wanted to ask something of you, sir. W.E.B. smirks. Anything. County jams his hand into his pocket to hide the trembling. He could use a drink right about now. With your permission, I, I would like to take Yolanda's hand in marriage. W.E.B. is overjoyed. He lets out a deep laugh and hugs County, slapping him on the back. Of course, of course you can have Yolanda's hand. I can't think of nobody better to be my son-in-law. A couple of hours later, after the other guests have gone home, County finds himself on a bended knee in front of Yolanda. She looks surprised. W.E.B. stands off to the side with his arms around Yolanda's mother. Uh, will you do me uh, the honor of marrying me, Yolanda? Of making me the happiest man on earth? Yolanda says yes. Her parents are overjoyed. County is less so. He's happy to be solving his image problem with this marriage and to be getting closer to his father figure, W.E.B., but on the other hand, it's going to be hard to resist the temptation of men. W.E.B. takes County's hand and shakes it vigorously. Welcome to the family, son. County's worries float away. He's got another family. For now, he's just got to resist his desires for Harold's everything. As a professional welder, Shayna Ford uses Forge FX to practice over and over, which helps her improve her skills. The more muscle memory that you have, the smoother your weld is. Learn more at meta.com slash metaverse impact. Black is beautiful. It's February 1928. County and W.E.B. were tediously planning the wedding. The bride-to-be lives in Baltimore. She has her say through letters she sends to her father. W.E.B. complains. Yolanda wants such a lavish wedding. She doesn't realize we can have a very lovely wedding without bankrupting me and her mother. County nods. He's also very concerned about the cost, but he understands that it's the talented 10th wedding. He chose some of his groomsmen to please W.E.B., like Robert Weaver. They met at Harvard, where County was studying literature. Weaver studied economics and wound up getting a doctorate there, just like W.E.B. County was right. The two men liked each other. He had to balance out his other choices. Langston Hughes and Arnold Bonton were fine. They were stars of the Renaissance. A touch of celebrity, like W.E.B. wanted. But his best man, Harold Jackman, County is unsure how W.E.B. feels about him. Can he guess that he and Harold have been together? W.E.B. would be disturbed to know that Arna and Harold had tried to talk County out of this marriage not that long ago. They didn't think he needed this marriage for his career. He definitely didn't need it for romantic reasons. And he didn't need it to remain friends with W.E.B. But he's in too deep now. Reverend Cullen has offered to leave some of the church's Easter decorations up for use in the wedding. There are canaries in cages, Easter lilies, more flowers. I think that will satisfy Yolanda. My father is happy to contribute in some small way, County says. County and Reverend Cullen are very conscious of the fact that W.E.B. is footing the bill. The Reverend has been telling people he has limited invitations and can't offer any more since the Du Boises are in charge. It's embarrassing. What do you think about this, son? We release a thousand doves the moment you and Yolanda exchange your vows. All County wants to do is make W.E.B. happy. 
within reason. County scratches his head. I think that may be too much. After the wedding, County takes Shalanda on a quick honeymoon. First to Atlantic City, then to Philadelphia, and finally to her father's childhood home, Great Barrington, Massachusetts. The trip doesn't go well. The newlyweds have a hard time connecting physically. Yolanda goes back to Baltimore. She's a teacher and has to finish the school year. County takes off for friends. He has a Guggenheim Fellowship. He takes his best man and his father with him. County's at the top of his career. He starts working on a new project. He's gotten great press for the wedding, and he can ignore the gossip in Harlem about his second honeymoon with Harold. The gag is, County's not sleeping with Harold. He has fallen into an affair with Edward Perry, who is in Europe on tour with the play Porgy. Edward used to be a gossip columnist who once wrote about County's love life. When County goes to visit Edward in London, Harold warns him not to share the real details of his childhood as easily as he had shared them with him. County had been so careful about protecting that truth. Harold didn't want him to be devastated when Edward would inevitably tell everyone about it. County took Harold's advice and just slept with Edward. So no secret shared. Yolanda gets to Paris, and she's not happy. She's expecting a real marriage, even after County fumbled their brief honeymoon. But she won't be getting that either. Even worse, her father tries to manage her marriage from afar through a bunch of letters written to both her and County. Hey, 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 Harold told him, man, listen, man, don't be pillow talking. Just knock the boots. <laughs> Just don't tell him anything. County's like, mm-hmm, got it. So sleep with him. Sleep, don't, don't, no talking allowed. <laughs> he said, I know how to bend the twig now. Let's huh, go. What? <laughs> you know, you know what I came to do? We ain't came to do no talking. Oh, poor Yolanda. Here's what I want to know. Is she suspecting anything at this point? Because she's pissed off, but, like, she got to start putting two and two together. And I'm I'm mad the county didn't just tell her. Hey, well, hey, well, hey, well, let the tea, let the tea pour real fast. Hold on, hold on, hold on. To Yolanda, W.E.B. tells her to support her husband's work. You should make it easy for county to write and keep him regularly at it. You should not distract him or make him spend too much time catering to your entertainment. For once in your life... Get out the center of the picture. Stop thinking of yourself and being sorry for yourself or regarding the world as revolving about you and concentrate on the main job of having County Cullen do a year's work to which the world will listen. To County, he blames Yolanda for the sexual problems in the marriage. Yolanda does not know what she wants or loves or hopes for. If perhaps you could just bear with her and try again, perhaps, all will yet be well. Remember that this inexperienced girl, despite her years, does not really know what she is doing. Oh, my W.E.B. What? I That's would creepy. Be so, that is so gross. And this, creepy as hell. Like, bro, you talking about your daughter, bro? Oh like, you wildin'. God, disgusting. I'm also mad that he's not taking his daughter's side. I mean, we know from, from you know, this very show, the way that he was talking badly about her not being bright and being annoying and whining all the time. And now this is the time where you're supposed to be able to say, I know things are hard, but I believe in you and I'm here. And instead, he is talking behind his daughter's back. He's blaming her. And then he's talking to County and being like, yeah, she's old as fuck, but she don't know what she don't know what she's doing. <laughs> I mean, in, in, so I mean, he did. He did tell her in the letter, like, "Hey, shut up, cook, <laughs> and stay out the way." He said, "County needs to be writing books, and he needs to be, you know, razzling and dazzling and showing people that black people are smart. So, if you don't know what you're doing, just be quiet, stay out the way." 
Definitely. Like, don't be trying to distract him. Don't be trying to get entertained. The world don't revolve around you. I'm most, I'm most, my mind's thinking about, like, based off of how you were coaching your, your, your daughter's son to be a husband, I can bet my bottom dollar you probably was a shitty husband, too. Right. Exactly. Blaming it all on her does not does not bode well for his his marital history. Hey, fam, care more about solidifying that town of 10. Like, to hell, my daughter. My legacy is what matters. It's pretty bad. For a year, counting Yolanda's stay in this terrible marriage to make W.E.B. happy. Mr. Du Bois does not want this talented 10th partnership to fail. Back in Harlem, March 1929, the Amsterdam News is reporting on the marriage. One headline reads... The poet and wife live apart in Paris, but still seem friends. Yolanda and County regard themselves as incompatible. And to further complicate matters is a report to the effect that County is in love with the girl on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. Articles like this add pressure to the strained marriage. Finally, County thinks of a way to solve the problem with Yolanda directly. If he fails to repair the relationship and she breaks up with him, the rumor mill might ruin his career by exposing him as a homosexual. Maybe even worse than that, W.E.B. might not forgive him. He could be abandoned by the man who serves as his second father. He can't let this happen. Under. But I ask you make me a promise that you would not tell my secret or use it as a grounds for divorce. She stares at him in disbelief and he leans back on the door for support. Yolanda makes him wait, but he needs her answer. After what seems like an eternity, she promises that she won't use his truth against him. He apologizes again and again and leaves the room quickly, except again at a cost. Yolanda writes her father immediately. County told me something about himself that just finished things. Other people had told me too, but I, I thought and hoped they were lying. If he had not told me himself, but it was true, I wouldn't have believed it. But since he did, I knew then that eventually I'd have to leave him. I never loved him, but I had an enormous amount of respect for him. Having lost that, and having an added feeling of horror at the abnormality of it, I, I couldn't make it. I knew something was wrong physically, but being very ignorant and inexperienced, I shouldn't be sure what. I've heard of such things, of course, but the idea of it being true of anyone close to me gives me the feeling of horror and disgust. Horror and disgust. County thought W.E.B. must be feeling some version of that. By November 1929, he's asked in county for the address of his lawyer. The Amsterdam News writes about the divorce. Daughter of crisis editor gets divorced from poet son of Reverend F.A. Cullen. Their agreement had been reached under the most amicable relations between herself and her husband. County's career was relatively unscathed by the divorce. The gossip wasn't too harmful to his career. When he came back to New York in 1930, his friends held a stag party in his honor. His relationship with W.E.B. was broken, but the old man still valued County's career above all else. Things were calm at the moment, but a rough turn is just around the corner for County. The depression is underway, and white patrons are leaving Harlem for safer investments. He spent his career making his work palatable for white people. Will it pay off? This is episode three of our four-part series, The Talented Tenth. We use multiple sources when researching our stories, but the Encyclopedia of African American Society, Gay Rebel of the Harlem Renaissance, and the W.E.B. Du Bois Center Library at the University of Massachusetts Amherst were extremely helpful. A footnote, our scenes contain reenactments and dramatized details for narrative cohesiveness. 
Follow Black History for Real on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. Join Wondery Plus on the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Black History for Real is hosted by me, Francesca Ramsey. And me, Conscious Lee. Black History for Real is a production of Wondery and DCP Entertainment. This episode was written by Pia Wilson. Sound design by Greg Schweitzer. Theme song is by Terrace Martin. For DCP Entertainment, associate producers are Quentin Hill, Brittany Temple, and Chris Colbert. The senior producer is Ryan Woodhall. Executive producers for DCP Entertainment are Adele Coleman and DJ Treacy Trees. For Wondery, Lindsay Gomez is the development producer. The production coordinator is Desi Blaylock. Sophia Martins is our managing producer. Our producer is Matt Gant. Our senior story editor is Phyllis Fletcher. The executive producers to Wondery are Marshall Louie, Aaron O'Flaherty, and Candice Mariquez-Ren. <laughs>